Hello, friends. Today, I am joined by Regina Gravrock, who works as the Homeschool Partnership Manager at the Classic Learning Test, or CLT. She currently lives in Denver, Colorado, where she moved after graduating from Hillsdale College with a degree in English. Unsurprisingly, she loves all things outdoors, hiking, camping, and climbing, and all things literary, linguistics, reading, and tea. Rita Regina is always happy sharing about her time as a homeschooled student and discussing the conservation of tradition through education and community. Regina, I'm delighted to have you here today. So that's like the official bio, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and your own experience with homeschooling? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. So I was homeschooled all the way through. I did K through 12 with my family. I was raised in Wisconsin, so on the west side in Eau Claire, if anyone knows that area. Um, and it was an interesting start to homeschooling for my parents. My mom was kind of anti-homeschooling at the beginning. She had all the stereotypes. She completely thought like homeschoolers were crazy and only um, people who wanted to keep their kids like sheltered from the world would homeschool. But then she met, upon moving to Eau Claire, she met somebody who actually later on became one of her best friends. And she was a homeschooling mom. And her kids were just so kind and well-adjusted. And um, they included my mom, my older brother, so my mom's son, her first son. Um, they included him at a local cookout, even though they were much older kids. And my mom was just so impressed by um, the kids' maturity to include somebody else who isn't in the same age bracket. He didn't know how to play baseball, but they were like, come on anyway, we'll teach you how. And so she went over and introduced herself to the mom and said, like, your kids are wonderful. Where do they go to school? Um, they have such good manners. Like, they're so kind. I want my kids to be like them. Um, and especially at that time, homeschooling was not nearly as popular as it is now, which is great to see that it's becoming more popular. But the mom was actually a little bit hesitant to share. She's like, actually, well, I homeschool my kids. Um and so my mom had to completely undo all of her um, pretty negative stereotypes about homeschooling. Like, maybe this is the way to go. Maybe this is a great way to care for your children's character, not just their education. Um, and so that kind of made up her mind. She started homeschooling my brother um, and then homeschooled the rest of us. There's four of us total. I'm the youngest. Um, and she did various amounts of homeschooling with each kid based on personality and how well they worked. Some kids wanted to go more um, like a public or private school once they got into high school. But for the sister right above me and then myself, we both just worked really well in homeschooling. Um, we really thrived in that environment. And so I did homeschooling all the way through um, to, to the senior year of high school. And I finished out full. I graduated a little bit early, um, like usual for homeschoolers, but I still did four years of high school and all the bells and whistles with extracurriculars and everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's always fun to talk to a fellow homeschool graduate. So I was homeschooled from kindergarten through 12th, as was my brother. And then my husband was uh, homeschooled up through seventh grade. So it's always oh, fun. Yeah. I like to be like, I mean, we turned out okay. We're a little, a I know, little quirky, right? but I mean, quirky is more fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love the conversations with people who are just, they're just not familiar with homeschoolers and I don't blame them for it. But um, when they find out that I've been homeschooled, I get the comment, and I'm guessing you're probably in the same boat, too. You get the comment of just like, oh, well, you seem really normal. It's like, oh, well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's a not normal thing to say to somebody's face, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Regina, what were some of your favorite parts of the homeschooling experience? Yeah, so many. I know it's it's different for each kid. I think I really lucked out just... Um, <laughs> I had a great family to be around all the time. So I loved spending time with my family, being around my parents and my siblings. Um, I think my favorite part was just how customized the education was. The fact that it was an education for me at every step of the way. Um, and that was both for, honestly, in some ways, pros and cons for, um, for younger me, because my mom knew exactly what I was capable of which meant you weren't allowed to do anything less than exactly what you're capable of, um, which looking back, so grateful for it. I'm so thankful that that was the environment that I was educated in. But of course, in the moment, you're a little frustrated about it at times. Um, but I think that was just simply the best thing for me to be able to be raised in an environment with like your educator actually knowing you as a person um, and on that very individual level. 
because then all of your strengths can be um, brought out and strengthened even more and capitalized on, then all of your weaknesses, like they don't go hidden. Like you don't get to just cover them up. And even weaknesses in like character and your interactions with other people, all of that is called out by your family um, and your community because it is so close and it is so personal. Um, but that just means you have so many more opportunities for development and you don't feel like you're going unnoticed if there is something that's lacking in your life like it's noticed and it's brought to um the forefront and it's dealt with and i it, it was it's a struggle but i think it is such a gift to have that um it's a challenge um but i'm just thinking uh at hillsdale where i went to college the motto of hillsdale is strength rejoices in the challenge and that is kind of what homeschooling is. Like, it is a challenge because it's so personal. You don't get to run away from it. Um, but the strength in you really rejoices in that. Yeah, I sometimes have talked about, like, the best part of homeschooling is that I'm with my children all the time. And, like, the hardest part of homeschooling is we're always together all the time. Yes. Because you cannot escape, you know, their sin, their weakness, or my own as the mom, right? Exactly, and yeah. And so that's a gift because mm -hmm. we're educating the whole person, right? Not just the brain and just like, yes. okay, let's pour yeah, in some yeah. facts and send you home. Yes. Um, yeah. You're educating a whole person uh, towards wisdom mm -hmm. and the love of the Lord, but also that can be a challenge, you know? And I think that oh, yeah. can be difficult because uh, sometimes it would be easier to just ignore that part of yep. human development. Um, but yeah. it's also really a beautiful part of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, do you think there are any other challenges of homeschooling that you experienced or you've seen as a homeschool student? Yeah, I think there are just so many options that a lot of people don't know which direction to go in, which can be a challenge. It's very intimidating to have to actually customize your education or your children's education um, because you just feel like there are so many ways to go wrong. Um, but I think the beauty of homeschooling is it teaches you that there are actually so many ways to go right. Like there isn't just one answer to it. Um, and there are things that could be better or worse, but the mere fact that you are trying to customize an education to your child is already putting them at such a large advantage. Um, I just think it's, it's intimidating to have all of that responsibility on you as the parent, especially you got like a whiz of a kid and you're like, what if I, like, what if I don't prepare them well enough? Like, what if I ha I'm not setting them up for success? But um, I think we just see time and time again, the role of the parent is like the full development of the child, both intellectually and emotionally and spiritually. And um, that is terrifying. But you do know that when you become a parent, that this is your child to like, to, to help them create themselves. Like your job is to be there to help them create who they are as a person. Um, and homeschooling just kind of gives that back to you. Like, nope, this is still your responsibility. You get to stop, like stand by their side throughout this entire thing. Um, and with how many options there are out there, it can feel like you're going to pick the wrong one. Um, and there is trial and error. Like I know that there were times that we tried things and we very quickly learned, okay, this curriculum is not for us, or this extracurricular is not for us. We are not going to do it this way. Um, but those, even the things you do wrong are still that learning opportunity. When you have that mindset, like all of this is just creation of the person. And sometimes you do things and you learn a lot about the person because you don't want to do X, Y, or Z, you know? Yeah. So all of it is, all of it is fruitful in the end. I think it's just very hard sometimes to remember that and keep that in sight when you are so, um, I mean, you care so much about what you're doing. You're forming your child. Um, and when that's the, the end goal you have in sight, sometimes it's easy to get lost in the weeds of worrying that you're doing all the small details wrong. Yeah, definitely. Well, I was really excited to see that you had gone to Hillsdale. Uh, mm -hmm. I had friends from my own homeschool years who went there. I know others who have gone since. I actually really enjoyed a, a visit there uh, as a teen myself. But I was curious if that was your first experience with a more classical education or if that had been part of your home education growing up. So that was sort of like part one of my question. And then part two, just at now that you've gone through those four years of learning, like, do you think that that approach to education matters and how have you seen it impacting you? Yeah. Um, 
So as for whether classical education was part of my education younger, is I don't I, I always struggle with this question a little bit because I think it was in a way that I didn't really notice. Like I think it was kind of subtly woven in. And what I mean by that is um, there was always an emphasis on reading, reading really good literature and making sure that was always in the background. Um, I did Latin as um, a kid kind of all the way through until high school when I switched to Spanish. Um, we did grammar. We worked on um, memorization. I don't know how much of that was necessarily intentionally classical, though, because at the time, I'm not quite sure my mom knew so much about um like the classical education renewal movement. I don't think it was nearly as established. Um, and so more so what I think it was is she was finding anecdotally from people in the community what was working really well for their kids. And she started incorporating those things into our education. And it just so happens that the things that were working really well for other people's kids and what worked really well for her kids is what um, the classical education renewal movement champions, which is memorization and like having structure and order to those first couple of years, and then building on that with logic and critical thinking, and then moving on to a rhetoric portion. Um, in high school, I also did speech. I did um, NCFCA, which is a speech and debate forensics league that's national. Um, I only did the speech side of it. And so in a lot of ways, that was like the rhetoric extension. Like it all really retrospectively, I'm like, wow, that was very classical. But I don't know if it was ever intentionally with the label classical. It, so it was when I went to Hillsdale that I started realizing that like classical education is a thing and what it means to be classically educated and what that looks like. Um, and I think it's amazing. I think it is so worthwhile, so worth pursuing. I think um, there's a very structured way of doing classical education, and that's beautiful. And there's so much value to it. And I don't think it's necessary to do it that way. I think the necessary parts of classical education, and I think a lot of people in the renewal movement would agree with this too, um, is the sense of tradition, of understanding like what is true, good, and beautiful. And having those transcendentals in mind for your for your children's education, both in the way you educate them and then also making sure that they recognize the true good and beautiful in the world around them. I think that is the most important thing. Um, and how that is manifested can be much more of an emphasis on like scolay and restful learning. It can be an emphasis maybe more on more structure. And I think that comes down to more of the student's temperament and how they respond to their education. Um, but when I went to Hillsdale, that was the first time that we really explicitly talked about like the good, the true, the beautiful, what it means to be human, what is the human experience, what does it mean to be a good person, what does it mean to live in a good community, and to have piety to your community, um, and to the tradition that came before you. All of those things, like putting titles on these things that I just had vague senses of before, um, but never were named, that experience was so formative to finally be able to have like boxes in which to put all of this information in formation um, and to see it all fit together like puzzle pieces like that's really what uh, Hillsdale was for me was like completing the puzzle of all these little pieces that have been given to me throughout my education um, which is beautiful because now I actually have a way like I have the vocabulary to talk about it I have a sense of a way to communicate it to other people. I have a way to store that information in my mind um, with some kind of structure so that when I'm educating my children, like I know what I want to come out of it and I have some of the tools um, to get there along the way. And it's beautiful because at Hillsdale, I think you see the benefits of it so fruitfully in the community on campus. Um, there's such a variety of people there, of backgrounds and worldviews and opinions. Um, but I think what unites us as a community was always values. Almost everybody shared the same values, like the love, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And um, I just have never been part of a community that was so united before while still being so diverse. And that was so beautiful because you hear in classical education that when we're talking about the tradition, we're learning about what it means to be human, um, which should be then universal. But we see so many different kinds of people living different kinds of lives. We're like, well, how do we say anything about humanity as a whole if we're all individual and we're all so unique? And I think at Hillsdale, it was beautiful to see so many unique individuals trying to live like the good life, what it like to live what it means to be a good human in all of their different ways.
because everybody was doing it differently. Um, it was manifested completely differently, um, but all united in purpose. And you're like, oh, this is what it looks like. Like, this is what it looks like to be in a good, fruitful community where we're all striving for the same thing, but each individual gets to do it in their own way. I love hearing how you got a vocabulary, like language is so important, right? If you don't have mm -hmm. the words for something, you can't really um, contemplate the idea, right? The only way to yeah. really deal with the idea is if you have the vocabulary. And so mm -hmm. what you received um, in those years was vocabulary to kind of be able to 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 think, to even be able to think about the things yes. that you sort of vaguely yeah. understood or felt, but you weren't yeah. actually able to think about those things until you had a vocabulary and a structure from which to address them. Yeah, that is so true. And that's one of the reasons I've always loved languages specifically, because when you think about how much the vocabulary you have in your life influences what you are capable of thinking about, which means like the more languages you learn, or the way a language talks about a certain concept. I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard of the examples of like the different words of for love in Greek versus just the one word for love in English and how much more nuanced our, our exploration of love can be if we have more words for it. We have a wider variety of that vocabulary. Um, and each time I learn a new language and I find out they have something like that where they have multiple words for our one English word, um, it just blows my mind of like how much there is out there that I just cannot think about because I don't have the language for it. My teen it's daughter and I, humbling. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say my teen daughter and I really think that there needs to be multiple English words for the word friend. Like we're so limited yes. by having that one word in English because oh, yes, it's like so true. you think of someone who's like your close, like ride or die friend, you know, you do anything yeah. for them. And that's different from the person that you're like a a colleague too, but you don't really want to use the word colleague because you are yeah. like their friend, but it's hard yes. having that one word. Um, it kind of seems to cheapen or minimize a true, like deep, rich friendship if just mm -hmm. all of the connections you have are all friends. So yes. And best friend sounds that. yeah, best friend sounds like so clicky and young and um and it's also a superlative and then you feel bad if you have multiple best friends. It's just it's I have never actually thought about that but I cannot agree more. If you guys come out with like new vocabulary words for friends, let me know and I'll adopt them. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> well, Regina, one of the things that as we were preparing for this conversation, um, sometimes behind the scenes for those who are listening, sometimes I'll ask my guests if they have any questions they enjoy answering. And one of the questions that you said you enjoy answering was, do you think homeschooling is for everyone? And I thought that would be a really interesting question to ask you and hear before we move on to talking more about the CLT. Yeah. So I do love talking about this. And I, the reason I love talking about it is because I really do love having conversations about it. Because at this point, I only have my own experience. Like I have not educated children. I don't have kids. And so I haven't gone through what I know is a struggle of being a homeschool mom. Um, and so I do know what it's like to receive a homeschool education. I know what it's like to have people like in my life, like my siblings who didn't homeschool all the way through. Um, but I don't know what it's like to actually put in the work. And so I, I say everything I say, I say with a caveat of like the humility of knowing that I haven't done it. And so it's very hard to tell somebody to do something that you yourself have not yet done. Um, but I do, I do really stand by that principle that we just as humans are gifted with both the right and the duty to educate the next generation. And that is just flat out true. Like in all ways we live our lives, we are educating the next generation by example in our interactions, whether you're a teacher or just like you work some random nine to five job, every interaction you have with the next generation, you are influencing them and you're educating them through your life. And that's something we can't avoid doing. It's part of our role as humanity is to pass on what it means to be human to the next generation. Um, and so I think in, in everything, we are educators. But when it comes to explicitly educating your children at home, I do think that is for everyone, but in different capacities. So I'll explain that. So I think when it comes to on the practical side of just like when you have young kiddos, you, the biggest thing that they're being educated in there is like 
to, to understand what it is like to experience a human life. So like the highs and lows, like how to handle emotions, how to handle pain, how to handle like jealousy and, and what it means to like own something or try to share it with somebody else. Like those, that's what we're going through as little kids. Um, and then learning to read. And that's like about it. Those are like the two things. Um, and I think it's so important to be around a family um, and to be in a very safe environment when developing that personhood, um, that if at all possible, being in a family environment in those young years, ideally doesn't take too much time for the parents because you're not doing lesson plans. You don't have a ton of information you need to give them. It's just you need to experience life with them, like to be a guide with them while they're um, learning what it's like to just live. Um, and then as you get older, I think that's when it starts to split off more so into um, the child's temperament and their needs, and also especially the family's time commitment. I understand like if you, because all of this is said with the caveat of like, we sometimes just have to work. Like there are um, financial burdens on families. And if you have to work, it's not like you're failing as a parent because you can't be there 24 um, seven. But if you have that small amount of time, being able to put it towards your children is, I think, one of the most important things we get to do. Um, but as kids get older, I think now especially, and I'm excited to see this get even better as years go on, there's so much support for homeschool families that I think it's becoming more and more possible for everyone to do it. Um, I know in high school, I took a lot of online classes. I know people who do high school almost completely online, or they do it through co-ops, where one mom in a community will teach one class, and another mom in a community will teach another class, and it's like uniting everybody's own abilities um, for the sake of the community. And when you have that kind of environment, um, it helps overcome so many of the barriers of like a, a parent's lack of education, like not knowing how to teach algebra two or something like that, um, while still allowing the child to have that, um, that at home in the family integrated experience. Um, so I think, I think homeschooling is for everyone for sure in the younger years, as long as your circumstances allow for it. Um, but I think with community, your circumstances might always allow for it. I, I say that, I, I, I do want to cushion that because I do not want any of this to be judgment on those families that do feel like that pressure between trying to provide for their family and then also being around and not wanting to maybe send their kids to daycare, but they have no choice uh, time-wise. Um, but I say it, so I don't say it as a judgment, I say it as an encouragement of it is, there are ways to make this work and it is possible. And if this is something that you really feel called to, that you feel like you want to give to your children, that you want to give to the world by educating and forming your children really well, there are so many ways and there are so many options um, and support for that, that I think the fear that comes along with it is understandable, but should not at all be the defining, like that should not be the thing that has the last say. Um, so I do, I do think it is for everyone. I think it may not necessarily be chosen by everyone. I think that's fine. It's not like a failure, but I do think it fits every kind of person because it is so customizable. You can make it work for your family and for your children and for their individual needs. I'll hear it there. Just at the end, you were talking about the value of a customized education. I know you said mm -hmm. that in your own homeschool experience, that was really valuable to you. So mm -hmm. it might surprise people to find out you're working with a standardized test. Yes. <laughs> so how did those two ideas go together? Yes. Please explain. Yeah, that is a great question. I know it's funny because I do so much harp on an individualized education and then standardized testing seems to completely go run, go against it. And I know I talked to so many homeschool families. They're kind of frustrated that testing even exists. They're like, why should I compare my student um, to some kind of national standard if they really are an individual? Like, shouldn't we just let them be educated on their own and do with that what they will? Um, and in response to that, I kind I have to, this is a two part question. There's a practical side, and then there's an idealistic side. On the practical side. Um, we live in a world that has testing. Like that is, you could say a necessary evil um, if you do want to term it as an evil. Like there are um, 
we have so many kinds of people interacting with one another through education and even in the working world that having some kind of standard to which we hold them all just helps. It's good to have um, a way to compare educations and um, backgrounds when you have such a variety. So on the practical side, like it's there, it exists. To get into a college, you have to take a standardized test. In a lot of states, just to homeschool, you have to take a test. Um, in a lot of careers, to get onto the next level, to pass, um, to get certified, you have to take tests. Like this is just one of the skills that um, your children need to be educated in. Like you need to take a test so that it's not the first time they ever take a test when there are you know thousands of dollars of scholarships riding on it or something like that. So it's just on the practical side, it's a practical skill in the world in which we live. On the more idealistic side, um, if you really do truly believe that there are like good, true, and beautiful concepts that you want um, your children to be exposed to, if you truly believe that there is truth and that there is knowledge um, and that there is um, that there is a, a a level of development that each individual, on average, is capable of achieving through their education, that is something that you can kind of. Um, you can conceptualize in a test. And there is a lot that's lost in standardized testing. I will admit that because it does, it's quite simplified. Um, but that's something I think CLT does really beautifully, walking the line between those two things. Um, that standardization while also still like maintaining um, the actual standard to which we want to hold our children. And why I say that is because CLT emphasizes critical thinking and reasoning skills a lot more than any kind of um, like regurgitation of knowledge because our education will teach us so many different things materially. But ideally what education is supposed to be teaching you is how to think well, like how to educate yourself. Um, there was a really, I wish I could, Dorothy Sayers has a really wonderful quote about how education, the purpose of education is teaching the student how to learn and how to teach themselves. And anything other than that is not education. Um, and that's a total paraphrase. Of course, she says it way better than I do. But I think that is so true that there are, um, what we want to get out of education is the ability to interact critically with information that is given to us. And so, in the verbal reasoning section of the test, that's what you're given. You're given a passage of classic literature, and it's good quality literature. It stood the test of time. These are the writers and thinkers that are that have formed our Western identity for generations. And those are the people we want to be interacting with. And if you can interact with them and understand what is being said and understand the consequences of what is being said, that is what it means to be educated, like to be able to interact with multi-generations, including your tradition, including those who've come before you. Um, and then on um, in the math section, there is, it's checking the boxes of the standardized of like, what are you supposed to know for this grade level? But there's also such an emphasis on logic and problem solving, because that is also like, that is the character of what mathematics is supposed to be. You're supposed to understand what are the fundamental rules of the world in which we live and how can we use those rules and manipulate them to better understand the world in which we live. And that problem solving, that logic aspect um, is true for all good education. And it's not necessarily what curriculum you follow, but does your child know how to interact with their world? Um, and so CLT really strives to, to balance those two things. In our mission statement, we talk about reconnecting knowledge and virtue. So both understanding what it means to like just know what you need to know for your grade level, to check that box per se, while also understanding critical thinking and reasoning, like how do we interact with the world that we're placed in? Because that's not just a skill for standardized testing, that's a skill for life as a whole. So I hear some differences then with the CLT and maybe the standardized testing we are more familiar with, with this focus on ideas, critical thinking, the ability to problem solve. Um, are there other ways in which the CLT is like similar or different to maybe what parents are more familiar with already? Yeah, the biggest difference by far is the content and the focus of that content, the fact that it focuses on great texts of the Western tradition. So it's not based on Common Core um, curriculum. It doesn't change with time. That's the great thing. The only thing is it'll just be added to over time as our tradition continues to develop. But it's not like anything's going to be removed because it offends somebody. It's like, no, if, if 
if this is a thought that has influenced our Western tradition, even if we don't agree with it, we should know how to interact with it. Um, and we want children to be interacting with those on the test. And then um, beyond that, I think, so obviously, yes, content, that's our biggest thing. That's the thing we really focus on. But then also we want it to be accessible. Like we want it to be, um, it's made specifically with homeschoolers in mind. That was one of the target audiences that we kept in mind the entire time we were developing the test. And the constant like checkpoint when we're going back and expanding into private charter public school spheres, we always want to make sure it works for those at home families. And so how that shows up is that our tests are online and they were online before the SAT or ACT ever developed an online version. Um, you can take them at home so you don't have to find a testing site. And you can also replicate your educational environment because that will be your testing environment. Um, and then all of the tests up through, like excluding the college entrance exam, are parent proctored as well. Because we truly believe that parents are primary educators. Like they are fully capable of educating their children, which means they're fully capable of proctoring a test. The exception to that is the CLT, which is the college entrance exam, because it has millions of dollars of scholarship riding on it. And you get into a whole legal world there of having high stakes testing and parents proctoring. But um, yeah, maintaining an accessibility for homeschoolers and maintaining um, kind of having a test that legitimizes that form of education. So whether we like it or not, tests set standards for education. And when you have a test that has traditional content um, and emphasizes critical thinking and reasoning skills, it legitimizes an education that also prioritizes those things. And we see that kind of education so often in the homeschooling world. And so when you have a test that that looks like a homeschool education, then you have even more credibility to a homeschool education. So what would preparing for the CLT look like then? Mm -hmm. Ideally, that's just having a good education, like a quality education is the best preparation for the CLT. Having an education that asks questions, I think is the best way to say it. So asking questions of what you read, asking questions even of, of what math concepts you learn, like why does this work the way it works? Not just memorizing, um, not just um, <laughs> regurgitating what you intake, but actually truly understanding the concepts behind it. Um, and then on the very practical side, um, for a lot of people, the biggest transition between any kind of regular education and standardized testing is time management. Um, so my biggest recommendation is to take practice tests. We provide online practice tests for free um, for the CLT 10 and CLT because we understand that this is a new experience for a lot of people and we don't want that to be a barrier. So using those practice tests and just getting used to what it feels like, not only to reason, but part of really good reasoning is effective reasoning which involves some kind of time aspect, like how quickly can you find the solution? Because part of finding the solution is figuring out how to like work out the problem. It's not just finding the answer. Um, and so finding the most efficient way to work out the problem and then finding the answer is a question of timing. Um, and so just understanding how to work through things quickly um, and also how to leave things alone if you don't know them. That also might be a big transition for a lot of people is there are questions on a standardized test that are supposed to be above your difficulty level. So if you don't know how to do them, take your best guess and move on. And like you have to you just have to let go and you have to go on to the next section. Um, so I think those are good test taking skills um, to practice for taking the test, but also honestly good skills in my opinion, for life in general. Like it's good for us to know how to reason effectively and efficiently and quickly. It's also really good for us to know how to let go of things that um that we might not be able to solve at that moment. Like there are bigger fish to fry. So yeah, I love that. I think that just points to test taking being a skill. Like that is a learned mm -hmm. skill. Um, Absolutely. And while I don't have personal experience with the SCLT, I had a really great experience standardized testing growing up as a homeschool student. So and I've good. taken those lessons as in our state, we are required to do annual testing. And so mm -hmm. definitely have tried to pass on that really positive test taking yeah. experience to my kids because- yeah. You know, my, my husband is an engineer. He had to take many tests mm -hmm. just to get his certifications for different levels. You know, you can't just avoid tests just because you don't yeah. like them. Um, yes. And so to have that as a skill, as a learned skill, is really 
important. And um, I'll put a link in the in the show notes for this episode too, just to kind of my more generic um, standardized testing prep um, post that I did, which has a, an apple puzzle because snacks are also very important on test taking yes. days. You got to have the fun snacks. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> and that's, that's also such a good point too, I think. And you know this then very well, especially if you had a good relation, like a good experience with um, testing. The testing is supposed to be a tool for the educator. Like that is that is the goal is just to to let the educator know where the student is at, which means as a homeschool parent, like you get to choose what you do with those results. You may put those results in a in a um, drawer and like never look at them again. Um, but really what it is supposed to do is just help you see a new perspective of your student um, to get a better grasp of where they are. Because you know so much about your student when you're interacting with them like day to day with their education. You know a lot. Um, but there are some things that slip through the cracks, some things that you just don't notice. Because some when you have the micro view, sometimes you miss out on the macro view. And that test is just supposed to give you a macro view, like reframe, here's where you're at. Um, and then you use that however you want to. And that's the great thing about standardized tests is they are not telling you what to do. They're just giving you things, giving you information to work with. And then it's up to you how you want um, to act on it. Yeah, that's a really great piece of advice. Hopefully that, I think also for a mom maybe who's worried about testing, to hear that yeah. perspective, like that just takes a lot of pressure off right? Just to, this is just information gathering. Yes. This is not a, yes. a high yep. pressure situation. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Regina, this has been great. And I know it will be an encouragement to the homeschool parents listening, but here at the end, I want to ask you the questions I'm asking all of my guests this season. Yes. So the first is just, what are you personally reading lately? Yeah, well, right now, actually, I'm, um, I'm reading the Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. And that has been such a delight. It's so fun to return to those good, like those those books, especially of childhood. Kind of there's like the nostalgia aspect of it, but also realizing why good books that are like part of our tradition are part of our tradition because they're delightful to read. Like they are delightful for children. The stories are interesting. The characters um, are compelling. But then even as an adult, you reread it and you're like, oh no, this still captures the imagination. Like this still captures not just the childhood imagination, but the like moral imagination of an adult. Um, and so when you read books that you read as a kid and you're still just as enamored by them, that's such a beautiful feeling of like, wow, this is good. Like this is actually just good because it's good for any age and it's good for any experience. Um, so that has been a delight to reread that one and to revisit and just kind of enter back into that world um, and learn those lessons again that the book teaches. Yeah. Good books like Lord of the Rings or Chronicles of Narnia. These are books that grow with you or you grow with yes, the books. Yes, when, I don't know yes, which yes, would yes. be the right way to say probably it. Probably both. Yeah. Probably both. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The, the final question I have for you, and it would be interesting to hear your perspective, obviously, as the student in your past, um, but what would be a tip you would give for dealing with a homeschool day that just seems to be going completely wrong? Oh, gosh. Um, I know that this worked scarily well when I was a kid. Um, if we were just having a rough day for whatever reason, whether like really hard to focus or it just feels like nothing would get done, um, our mom would have us take laps around the house. She would just have us run outside. Um, and it's whether if it was like she needed a break or we needed a break, it didn't matter. <laughs> like that was the way to go. And we would just run around outside. And I think this is so important. Um, I, you mentioned like this was in my bio, um, just how much I love spending time outdoors and doing active things. And I think when you live in an intellectual world, and this is coming from an English major, so I do know about the intellectual world, um, sometimes we forget that we are both mind and body. And I think giving some acknowledgement again to the body <laughs> just helps like recenter. When you're so focused on um, developing your child intellectually, sometimes their physical development can feel a little bit ignored. And um, sometimes you do just need to run. 
you do need to run outside, you need to climb a tree, you need to like look at wildflowers, like that just needs to be part of your education is to acknowledge the fact that they are both like mind, body, or all three, mind, body, and soul, and giving them formation for all of that, leaving room in your day for all of that, um, can help one from becoming too overwhelmed. And so I think just letting your children be children, and if they're having a really bad day, you are not going to fail them um, by giving both of you guys a break. And just like spending some, like my mom would always say, getting our yayas out, like just getting the energy out, letting the child be like that physical child for a little bit. Um, and I remember those times so fondly, even if sometimes it was a little bit of a punishment because I was being an obnoxious kid and she would send me outside. I still loved those times because it was so good. It was so good for me to just be physical and get outside of my brain for a little bit. Yeah, that's great. Don't be a Gnostic, right? It's not just about the mind. Yes. Got to have the body exactly. too. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Well, Regina, where can people follow up with you online? And also where can they learn more about the classic learning test? Yeah. The easiest place for information for CLT is cltexam.com. Um, that's our website. We've got a lot of information on there. We also, on our media page on our website, you can see we've got a blog, which has a lot of good um, a ton of information. We have a wonderful editor who writes these blog posts um, and he goes through basically like snapshots of history. And right now he's going through all the fallacies and giving examples of them and explaining them like logical fallacies. So there's a wealth of information on the blog. And then we also have a podcast that's very involved in that classical education renewal movement. Um, and so it's interviews with our CEO and others in CLT with just leaders in the education movement. So I think those are really great resources for kind of keeping like an ear to the ground. And then if you have any specific questions really about anything, but especially if it's about uh, CLT or testing or homeschooling or anything like that, you can find me at homeschool at cltexam.com. That's my email. Um, it'll go straight to me. And that's a great way to stay in touch. Perfect. I will have links to all those things you mentioned in the show notes for this episode over at humilityanddoxology.com. Thank you to everyone who has either listened or watched. I would love it if you would take a minute to share this episode with a friend you think might enjoy it. Make sure you're subscribed in your podcast app or on YouTube. And I look forward to learning more about the CLT and chatting with you again. Thanks so much.